ok. So, now let us write out the space of strategies for both players. So, so actions for player 1, the actions are L1, R1, player 2, actions are L2, R2. Now, what are the strategies? This we have to be careful about. So, remember this is a dynamic game. So, a player's strategy is a function now of what he knows. Okay. So, for let us first do the simple one. What is what are the strategies for player 1? It is L1 or R1, right. So, let us I will write this formally. Let us write this as gamma 1 is the set of strategies for player 1. It is all those functions gamma 1 such that they are constant functions. Okay. So, these are just constant functions or their strategies. So, act they therefore reduce to actions. Yeah. Because he has uh, he starts the game, right? He has only one information, which is just which is that he is at node x. No, 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 that is not. So, the strategy, so that was how we computed the optimal strategy. The space of strategies is simply to play either L1 or R1, but which, which action to play is to be computed through this logic. Okay, these are two different things. I will, I will, uh, let me just complete with you. So, you see this. So, here, is a part what we have computed is a particular strategy for player 1 which is to play L1. But the space of strategies is any way to play either L1 or R1. Yeah, it is a function of the information and the function of the inf uh, information is that so, so the information that player has ok, ok let me get to this also so again we are a little bit jumping ahead, but there are two types of information when we are talking of information there are two things. First is what is the information you have at the start of the game. At the start of the game, both players know the tree. Okay, that is common knowledge. Okay, they would they also know what each would know during gameplay, and that's another piece of information. Okay, the information players would have during gameplay. Okay, the things the information they acquire during gameplay is another thing altogether. In this case, player one doesn't have any additional information than the one he started with during gameplay. During gameplay, he just starts with x and that is it. During gameplay, player 2 does have additional information, right? And that is why this is a dynamic game. So, player 2 does come to know during gameplay whether he player 1 has played L1 or R1, ok. Both players know that this is what players would know during the gameplay. Is this clear? ok. So, so strategies are functions from what from the information they would have during gameplay to the actions that they have to take during during in, uh, at each in, at each uh, at each node ok. So, the action the the functions that uh, so therefore, player 1 would only have the you know just a null information to start the game with and so, he has his strategies are to play either L1 or R1. Player 2 has during gameplay the information that it he is either at node z or at node y and then he is in his strategies are functions from that to actions. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we that is why we so that is why this is this is therefore uh, these both of the, these things that I wrote out are heuristic. So, once we write out the Nash equilibrium, then everything will you know that will give you the proper theory. This is still heuristic, right? This is as, as I said, this is a, we are just re, uh, sort of trying to kind of uh, motivate uh, a mode of play, ok. So, for that, let us write out the strategies, then it will become clear. So, yeah, someone else had a question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, players know the entire tree ok uh, to begin with at the start of the game. So, the, the tree is common knowledge as we as we um, as we start the game 
ok. So, so these strategies for player 2 are these. So, let me write it like this uh, I am keeping the do nothing strategy ok. So, so gamma gamma 2 at z is always do nothing and gamma 2 at y can be either uh, what L2 or R2. So, how many strategies do each do these players have? So, how many strategies for player 1? For player 1, it is 2 strategies either the constant strategy L1 or constant strategy R, R1. What about for player 2? Okay. So, now let us do the following. We let us make the matrix then. So, the first one gamma 1 player 1 has 2 strategies player 1 gamma 1 1 and gamma 1 2 player 2 has 2 strategies gamma 2 1 and gamma 2 2. So, gamma 1 1 is the L 1 strategy gamma uh, 1 2 is the R 1 gamma 2 1 is is this do nothing do nothing comma L 2 and gamma 2 2 is do nothing comma r2 let's write out write this uh, write this table out if player 1 plays gamma 1 1 and player 2 plays gamma 2 1 what would we get what would the players get which means player 1 plays l1 and player 2 is playing gamma 2 1 which is do nothing comma l2 in 0 2 right okay now gamma 1 1 and gamma 2 2 if it is once player 1 is playing L 1 it is 0 2 2 uh, 0 2 for both ok. What about this? Uh, gamma 1 2 is R 1 followed by L 2 which is minus 1 comma minus 1 and this here is 1 comma 1 ok. Now, we can this is your so so, what we have done effectively is we have written out the payoffs of the players. We have written J, J1 of gamma 1, gamma 2 and J2 of gamma 1, gamma 2. These are the payoffs that are there that the players have in the space of their strategies, right. For, so, assuming each player plays their strategy, this the, the so you assuming a profile of strategies for each player, you get these payoffs that is given in the table. And as before now, we can since the strategies remember are being played are being picked before the game starts we can talk of a nash equilibrium for the for this game in this space of strategy right so we can, we have to then essentially look for a gamma 1 star so a nash equilibrium is a gamma 1 star gamma 2 star This is your Nash equilibrium as before. Oh, sorry, not since you are maximizing, let us put a greater than equal to. Yeah. Okay. So, effectively, all I have to do is then look for the Nash equilibrium in this table. This table is now just a zero is is a is a non-zero sum game with two strategies for each player. I have basically forgotten the dynamic aspect of the game altogether, and I have just listed out the strategies explicitly, and now I am looking for the Nash equilibrium in this space. Okay. Okay. So, so let us look at this then what what are the Nash equilibria of this game. So, this here is one Nash equilibrium 1 comma 1 is a Nash equilibrium ok why how how does that come about. So, if you uh, so that so player 1 so if player 2 is playing gamma 2 2 if player 2 is playing gamma 2 2 then he is basically promising to play R 2 at node y and do nothing at node z. So, assuming player uh, player 2 is playing gamma 2 2, it is optimal for player 1 to play gamma 1 2 ok. So, uh, and likewise assuming player 1 is playing gamma 1 2 ok, it is optimal for player 2 to play gamma gamma 2 2 ok. So, this is uh, so you can compare 1 with minus 1 and 1 with 0 here ok. So, this is therefore an Nash equilibrium ok. 
what about are there any other nash equilibria the first one here this is also a nash equilibrium so this this here is a nash equilibrium and why is this a nash equilibrium this is because assuming player 2 plays do nothing and l2 it's optimal for player 1 to play l1 okay and uh, because he is comparing 0 with minus 1 and assuming uh, uh, player 1 plays l1 it's assuming one player 1 plays l1 player 2 can play anything because they both give him uh, give him 2 okay so this is also this is an actual so you can see here that this is basically once we once we wrote this game out as formally in term in the space of strategies and look for the nash equilibrium the nash equilibrium has pointed us exactly to these two outcomes you have one outcome here which is which is uh, the the first mode of play that we thought of that player 2 plays r2 maybe i'll just write this here this is this is your r2 this is l2 this is l1 this is r1 okay so the first mode of play here was where player 2 played uh, player 1 played r1 player 2 responded with uh, with uh, with r2 and the second one which we thought which is the threat one where player player 1 played l uh, player 2 pl promised to play l2 and player 1 played l1 okay so so what this means what, so the uh, so this is actually one of the this is this is this is again i, I think uh, really a feather in the cap for the nash equilibrium that that it is able to produce all of these the uh, that it is able to point you to these kind of outcomes which would have uh, which you know would have escaped our a very sort of a, a naive reasoning you know most people would have not even have guessed that there is a such a this thing but a fantastic prediction comes out from the nash equilibrium when you follow through it uh, when you follow through the logic formally okay here is another thing to point out is there any dominance here anything dominates anything r2 weakly dominates l2 right now go back to your uh, to your reasoning some of you were very uh, wanted to say that you know you no know, player 2 should be player 2 should uh, should play r2 right and player 1 should know that and therefore player 1 should play uh, should play r1 right effectively what you are saying is you are saying that i should eliminate l2 i should eliminate gamma gamma 2 1 so this is this this is not just true for this particular game this is true in general for any dynamic game what you will find is that the threat equilibrium you know there is there is going to be this feature here that the threat you know has this will have this feature that the fellow who is issuing the threat right he does a, it it would not matter to him what he was doing elsewhere so he would get the same payoff regardless of what happened he would have multiple strategies would which would give him the same payoff and that would mean that, that there would be some weak dominance so if you remember in our last class we looked at this producers game in that if you remember when we looked at the nash equilibrium from the static game and we said that the best response for the second producer if the first producer is playing at a at at the at the static nash equilibrium level the best response for the second producer was to produce was to come up with any function so long at so long as at this level at the first producer's level it matched with the with the static best, static best response at this for the first producer's level it should be giving you the static best response elsewhere it could be anything and in fact elsewhere it it was taken as constant it was it was taken as a constant thing he played the same thing regardless uh, regardless of what so this 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 particular feature right comes up comes up again and again and that what that ensures is that you ha what that basically does is it, it gives you weak dominance so ignoring the threat equilibrium so in my view ignoring the threat equilibrium then amounts to eliminating a weakly dominated weakly dominated strategy now we have seen before that whenever we would eliminate weakly dominated strategies you land the 
you stand the risk of eliminating equilibria as well. And that is effectively what is happening when you when you when you stick to a particular line of reasoning which is coming from you know this backward reasoning or uh, the backward induction or dynamic programming it is essentially keeping you blind to the other possible equilibria that are there and they are they are getting eliminated. This is also one of the reasons why I have conviction in this as a possible as as a completely valid mode of play ok uh, that uh, that you know the same reasons why we could do not uh, we 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 do not justify the elimination of weakly dominated strategies should also justify why this particular uh, equilibrium should also should be treated at par with the other equilibrium. Okay. Yeah. What do you mean? Mm. No, but we never said <laughs> well he is trying to maximize his payoff and the payoff is given in this matrix. Which is which is the point? The point is that whether that whether are you is it is this an obligation that you should be rational at every stage if you want to be considered as rational? Or can you be uh, as I said is there a next level of rationality which involves some selective irrationality that, that so all of this this is exactly this is as I said this is a matter of this is a this is a matter of debate I think may, people will uh, there are some people believe one way one people believe the other way the point is that you know uh, really the we are the the actually the you know at some level the you can say the issue is that Beyond this, right, you cannot really say from the standpoint that game theory has taken. The game theory has taken the standpoint that I am, I am going, that we are going to be observers of the game and we want to, strictly speaking from the assumptions, we want to come up with, uh, come up with what we think is the outcome. And with no additional assumptions, this is as far as we can go. If you want something more, you need additional assumptions. The, uh, I mean, what the debate that is going on is whether these assumptions are enough to somehow rule out, rule out the L1, L2 type of equilibrium. Again, other just one thing, because if it were to occur multiple times, then one would have to optimize over. No, then that is a different thing altogether, ok. I understand. So, uh, if the game occurs multiple times, right, say for example, you, you know, the, this kind of, uh, altercation with an uh, on a geopolitical thing you know you keep having negotiations peace talks and every time uh, so if 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 you know that there is a multiple there is an iteration involved then the nature of the game dif differs because you would play differently knowing that this is going to be an interaction that's going to happen multiple times so that is what is called a repeated game okay I, if we have the time we can look at repeated games repeated games lead to a different uh, uh, has, you will have to model it appropriately. It is a particular form of a dynamic game, uh, but with the same structure repeating again and again, ok. There you will have um, you know depending on uh, the actually there there are many many strange results that come up. For example, if you allow enough repetitions, pretty much anything can become an Nash equilibrium. And which is which is also one side in some sense a critic of game theory, criticism of game theory that you know if you can give if everything can become a Nash equilibrium with enough interactions, then what is the meaning? Uh, what is the meaning of having such a theory as well? So that is that that kind of thing can also happen. But the reason for that is because basically when the game becomes large enough, if you have enough number of repetitions then this number of strategic trajectories you can take become very very large and a player by issuing threats for saying that from if you do not agree to this from here onwards I am going to punish you. That sort of a strategy can be applied for pretty much any type anything ok. So, if there is a large enough repetition then uh, you know such that such threats can be issued and pretty much anything can be done. So, yeah so the so repeated games is a different matter altogether we are talking of the game that we have at hand which is just this. Okay, there is we are playing once. This is this is the tree, and this is these are the pairs. 
Oke. Okay. Ya. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a good thought. I mean I've not thought about this whether you can um so I have thought about something else, which is which is this, and I'm in. A, I mean, I, uh, but I've not written a paper on this. Uh, I mean, if anyone, so because I've not had uh, time to work it out. But there is this possibility of thinking about what you can say are ulterior motives. Okay, in games, so an ulterior motive would be that you have one objective which you project, but your actual objective is something else. Okay. So, the game is then played with one objective, but you play, but so in this game you look irrational, but you have there is a bigger master strategy going on in a larger game in which you are rational, okay. So, so effectively that becomes like a you know an optimization and with over a another game uh, when you are playing for you are looking to pick the best equilibrium out of this out of a particular game. Okay, for the purpose of optimizing your actual object, okay, or ulterior. So I think that could be a way to sort of build in selective irrationality as a choice. Okay, it would give a more formal framework for doing that. But yeah, I mean, we can talk offline if you want. But I mean, since this is like like now getting to very cutting edge stuff, right? Because it's not even I don't. There's no one who's written a paper on this also, so I can't even. Uh, uh, we can't discuss uh, this, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is this could be one approach. I mean, that we we you could try to where you switch on and off your rationality, you know, as part of a strat, you know, strategic choice. Yeah. No, no. Why not? It fits. It's a. It's a game of. It's a game of complete information. Actually, so I, no. No. No issues with. No. No. It is. It is this equilibrium. No. I. I there is no. Uh, the. The. See. This is. This is. Comp in fact, my point is that this equilibrium is in fact coming through very clinic. If you just follow clinically the logic of game theory, right? This equilibrium comes out as an Nash equilibrium. So it is. It's a. It's a valid prediction. Uh, I mean, there is no. In fact, you do not need anything else to make this uh, occur. It's a. It's an Nash equilibrium of the game. What you want to do is maybe you want to put in additional assumptions and refine it further to then get you to get to this. If you you know, if you so desire, if you want to say that okay, under what assumptions is this more logical? You might have to put in some additional assumptions. That's okay. That's a different thing altogether. But but this is the just to produce this outcome, which is your L one L two outcome. We do not need anything else. L one L one. No. So that is just a that is. No, 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 no. He doesn't have that information. It is an outcome. The way we not, gen, we would have, we would have, uh, the way we would have otherwise reasoned about this game. So suppose if I had just given you this game, this table, and asked you to find the Nash equilibrium, what would you find? You would find these. What you can do is, ex post, having found the Nash equilibrium mathematically, you can try to say what is actually happening strategically in the game, and that's this. I do not need to have you know a threat letter with me to actually <laughs> to in fact play this uh, play this particular strategy. Okay, see the the as I said the issue is essentially I think my my own feeling is that given given how little we have assumed right this is as far as we can go. If you want to refine further, you need some additional this thing. Some additional criterion has to be there. Okay. Now again, we uh, that's another topic again, which is called refinement of Nash equilibrium. Refinement of Nash equilibrium is that you put in some additional requirements, 
you as we said nash equilibrium is a is a basic requirement is a necessary condition now you can ask okay is there can we put in some more demands and refine that set okay so one of the demands is for example you can say well these payoffs are not perfect okay this is this is actually 0 comma 2 plus epsilon and then you look for an equilibrium which is uh, as a function of epsilon and then let epsilon go to 0 okay now it turns out that some some nash equilibria get vanish in the limit they do not they do not remain equilibria anymore so you will get equilibria for uh, so or some nash equilibria cannot be approached through such a limit which means that they are equilibria for this specific numbers but if the numbers had were slightly off then they would not remain equilibria anymore okay which means that they are you know in the in the language of this thing they are not stable in in some sense, so it's not stable to uh, to small perturbations, or they are not robust, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so then those can be eliminated. Okay, now that's a one type of reasoning. That's basically saying that you know imperfections in the data and so on, which are leading you to this sort of a uh, could have led you to a slightly different table. Then um, uh, they they, sh they do not retain the certain equilibrium. So the, you pick the equilibrium that is amongst all equilibria pick the one that has that is remaining because that is actually at least the equilibrium that uh, that is uh, uh, that is um, remains a uh, valid pr uh, outcome even despite this perturbation now you can think of it in a slightly different way also you can say well if uh, so here the perturbation is because you are not sure of the data as as a this thing Okay, as an observer of the game, you are not sure of the data, and so you. The other other could be that the players are themselves not clear. Okay, so there is therefore noise in the data. Okay, wherein that the, the so the player players do not know which value of the game is being played, and there is in fact so what you have is a is is an ensemble of games, and one of them is being chosen, and then you let the noise go to zero. That's another way of choosing. So these are all different ways of doing what we call equilibrium selection. Okay, yeah. and uh, there are uh, you can well there are also more rudimentary logics like you can say well uh, take uh, take this thing for example the deer uh, deer uh, rabbit game. In that uh, it turns out that deer deer is better for both players as compared to rabbit rabbit. Rabbit rabbit gives both players half. Deer deer gives both players two. If I Q or one or whatever it was, so it gives both. It's uniformly better for both players to play deer deer. So then, why would they play rabbit rabbit? So you can say that from that logic, you try to eliminate. But see, the more the more you start putting layers like this, right? The class of games for which this remains applicable becomes smaller and smaller. Okay. So the real challenge always is to say come up with a universal logic that is on par with Nash's logic. And still, uh, you know, gets you a smaller set. Okay, so I'll give you an example. A paper I wrote in by about uh, what uh, fourteen years ago, I think. Now, what? Yeah, fourteen years ago. So this was uh, yeah, from my uh, from my PhD days. So there, uh, that time we were. I was looking at a certain set of games in which there were a continuum of equilibria, not not just multiple, but a continuum, infinitely many equilibria. Okay, and I argued that in that so over there, so then the equilibrium could be interpreted over there as if it was being interpreted by uh, an administrator who was charging some prices. Okay, in some extreme, you can look at a like a thought experiment. Take some extreme case in which the equilibrium had this interpretation that it was it the, it was coming out by. Uh, through the imposition of some set of prices, okay, that some extreme example had to be taken to do that. And there I argued the following, I said that well, now suppose this sort of a game arose in, in say an in internet, in the internet where players are anonymous, okay. Now if this, if this equilibrium arose in the game uh, where players are anonymous, then the, then the administrator cannot distinguish between the identities of the players. He only knows the actions, but he cannot distinguish between the 
players ids because players identities are anonymous and they can be spoofed and so on so basically then i what i said was that you can think of a theory in which games uh, you can think where the equilibrium is robust to identity fudging okay the yeah. and then from there so what happens then is that this continuum of equilibria that are there it turns out that only one out of them remains robust to this it has this sort of symmetry property some kind of a symmetry property and all these other equilibria that are there they they require the the administrator to know the exact ids of the players that this is player 1 this is player 2 this is player 3 etc so his the pricing then is non uniform in the players and it it requires you to know the id identity of the player and so therefore on that on those grounds you can now eliminate all of these equilibria because all the other equilibria because this one is the only one that is implementable in a in a certain extreme okay so it has it carries therefore more merit or more meaning so this was a way if i and and then you have to argue that such an equilibrium always exists uh, uh, you know the one that is implementable is always exists and so on and so that is then i propose that as a refinement okay so this that's a that is that is one uh, that's a that is one of my uh, one of my results where i basically refined the nash equilibrium by using this particular logic now what this does is it basically takes the full set of equilibria where you had this continuum of equilibria and produces for you a single one okay so the now but but that does not mean okay that does not mean that you always have to face with situations where players are anonymous i have argued that this carries more meaning because of this you know this thought experiment that i have done but that doesn't mean the others are devoid of meaning in fact if players are not anonymous others are just as good right and then you could you could go back to those equilibria which is something similar here and so this is the threat this is the sort of uh, challenge with refining equilibria equil the nash equilibrium all the time you start with something you you take it to some kind of extreme you know, take some epsilon going to zero this that whatever you do and then you pull out a nash equilibrium but that doesn't mean that this epsilon had to go to zero or there was in fact a perturbation to begin with right so then then you are back to square one so this all, this whole refinement exercise is is very interesting very challenging and when you get a refinement you get a lot of attention and all that but you but it's not i, I mean since nash i don't know if anyone has been able to you know move forward on this uh, anything better than that because it's really you need that gold standard where it is applicable across the board no questions asked and yet yet carries a universal meaning Yeah. Mm. Because <laughs> because people are not trained. <laughs> there there is not too many people who do uh, who who know who know about the subject. So, you know who, so that needs. Yeah 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 yeah. So the, the game theory doesn't have enough analysis. Anyway, chalo. So today we are just. chit chatting so i think we'll end the class here